Good morning, everyone. My name is Dave, and I'm one of the pastors on staff. However you're watching us, thanks for making us part of your day. Over the next hour, we'll be singing a couple of songs, catching up on family news, and listening to another incredible story in the life of David, one of the major characters found in scriptures. Let's ask God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, thank you for our church family. Wherever we are, however we're watching or listening, that you would impact us and help us draw closer to you and to one another. We pray this in your powerful name. Amen.
Amidst the darkest nights And the longest days When my soul is tired And I don't feel your grace And I don't feel your grace and Through the storms of my life Through the pain in the night I'll praise Him anyway Praise him anyway. I will lift your name. And praise him anyway. When I need your love and your clothes. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your forgiveness in this time. You have shown us mercy more than we deserve, and may we choose to draw closer to you. Help us remove the things from our lives that keep us from truly living for you, and help us to remove the things that prevent us from true relationship with you. 
Allow us to seek your kingdom with greater strength and understanding as we leave this season, that during such a season as COVID, you would be teaching us many things about you and drawing us closer. We pray for our con your continued renewal of our world. We pray over the multiple tragedies that have happened in our community this past week. We pray for the Winkler family and Christ the King School as they mourn the loss of a student uh, in such a tragic event. May the church come around them and show them Jesus in such a dark time. May the trauma teams be able to be there with students and families when they are in need. Fill them with your love so they may show it to those who need it. Assist our partner Lone Prairie Camp and the Draggers as they plan for the summer ahead. Give them grace as they await the restrictions for summer. Be with the Draggers in this time of uncertainty. Whether the restrictions are uh, allowing them to do camp or having to do something else, keep them creative um, and allow them to assist the church in growing your kingdom. Help them raise enough finances to cover the past year and the coming future and keep them encouraged and excited about the times ahead. As we as a church head into a season of transition, allow us to communicate well and give us clear guidance as we look forward to the future with excitement. As we listen to the message today, help us to apply it to our lives and draw closer to you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. We have four words that we regularly use as we bring Jesus into life. Influence, invite, include, and invest. All of us are people of influence. We influence our families, our communities, our workplaces, and so much more. And if you've been engaging with our services for more than a couple of weeks, you found yourself influenced by Pastor Mel. And we want to celebrate the incredible work him and his wife, LaDonna, have done here at Ellerslie over the last seven years. Three ways to do that. One, we'll be having a Zoom farewell on Sunday, April 11th at 6.30, and everyone is welcome to join. Please email us at office at erbc.ca for the login info. Two, we're collecting cards of encouragement and any financial gifts you'd like to give them. You can drop these off at the church anytime between now and April 11th. And three, if you have a story you'd like to share, a word of encouragement or something to make their day, you can take a personal video and send it to us or stay tuned when our studio will be up to recordings. We encourage you to keep these tributes to about 30 seconds in length. We also want to be people of invitation. On Monday, April 5th, we'll be having an Easter extravaganza and hosting an Easter egg hunt in our church property from 1 to 3 in the afternoon. One of the highlights of my childhood was going to Grandma's house and having my dad and two uncles hiding bags all over the farmyard. Well, why not make use of our large church property? Invite a young family to join you. Invite your nieces and nephews, maybe your grandkids. The Easter story will be told through hidden eggs. And of course, every child will receive a treat bag at the end. What about include? We're looking forward to reopening our church doors on Sunday, April 11th. We'll have our traditional service at 9 a.m., followed by our contemporary service at 11 a.m. As great as video platforms have been over this past year, it will be so refreshing to see people in person and face to face. Why not call a couple of friends and say, hey, I'm going to be there on Sunday. Will you be there as well? Just a reminder, this will be Mel's last Sunday as our lead pastor. So you'll definitely want to pre-register for the service to make sure you have a seat. Finally, invest. Our annual Good Friday 50-50 offering is dedicated to projects that help influence the world with the gospel of Jesus. 50% goes to an international project, while the other 50% will stay a little bit closer to home. This year, the international project is in partnership with our global mission partners, Brian and Jessica Mirholm and Global Link Africa, an indigenous African movement that educates, equips, and deploys African missionaries. Our goal is to sponsor one missionary intern for one year, which includes a time of formal education as well as field work. The local project is with Lone Prairie Camp. Through the camp sponsorship program, we would like to sponsor 16 disadvantaged campers for a life-changing camp experience. In addition to your regular giving to Ellerslie, we invite you to partner with us in these projects. We'll be accepting donations until April 30th. To give, uh, to give go online at erbc.ca slash give or contact the church office. Before we dive into this week's message, here's a short word from Brian and Jessica. So as many of you know, we work with a local Ugandan organization called Global Link Africa. And Global Link Africa, they mobilize and they send African missionaries to communities in need of the gospel. Now, many of our missionaries are young people. They've all been on campus at some point, whether it be for a diploma or a degree or whatever. And they go out and they serve using their profession as a way to open doors. 
and uh, they serve in many communities throughout Uganda. And as well, we have an exchange program with Kenya, so that we have Kenyan missionaries coming to unreached parts of Uganda, and vice versa, Ugandan missionaries going to Kenya. Uh, our flagship program at Global Link Africa is a one to two year mission internship program. And in the mission internship program, our young adults, our young professionals, they receive training on missions as well as practical experience in the field. And they spend a good part of their year or more in the field serving people really in need. Um, it's a program that we're excited about and the good news is many of our um, young people who've done a one to two year mission internship have gone on to continue in missions much longer. So uh, this is something that uh, we're looking forward to Ellerslie Road Baptist Church partnering with, it, partnering with us on and we thank you so much for your support. We look forward to seeing you in about a year and a half. Thank you for your love and support. March Madness is here, the most glorious time of the year. NCAA basketball playoffs, basketball at its finest, and even COVID can't take it away. Well, except for the playoff party I like to host. The biggest dilemma will be how will I choose which of the games I've set to record I'll take the time to watch because I still have a job to do. As I thought about basketball and at the same time was immersed in the difficult and discouraging and disappointing episode in David's story that we come to today, I thought about one of the most important aspects of, of coaching in, in any sport or, or any skill, becoming a skillful musician, same thing, breaking down the physical mechanics of the fundamentals of the game into their individual movements, dribbling, shooting, blocking, out, setting a good screen, on and on, using different drills repetitively to work on each part of each one of those individual aspects, to develop muscle memory and, and make them instinctive. And the need to come back to them regularly because no matter how good we are, we just naturally tend to slip and to drift. If we're sports fans, we, we all know that the elite players who sustain their place at the top are those who show up first for practice, who work hardest in practice when no one's looking on their own game, on the mechanics. And they watch game film with a coach looking for the little things to improve. Was my head up or down? What about the position of my feet? Where was I looking? How and, and where was I holding the ball? Was my first step too long, too short, in the right direction? Details, 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 details matter. Oh yes, we, we look at the things we're doing well and can affirm, but to develop, to grow, to become who we want to be, we can't just blow off the things that we tend to not do well because when things come crashing down, and they do, it's a little late to say, oh, what went wrong, right? Sometimes people will say, and, and, and even we ourselves might say, well, things were going so well. But whether we see it or not, if we were to replay the tape, there were some little things with big impact that we either have been denying or have been naive to signals that were ignored, blown off, or just plain missed, right? And so it was with David, King David, the man after God's own heart. When somebody says to you, David and, what comes to your mind? Perhaps for most people, the first thing that comes to mind is David and Goliath. A peak moment in David's experience, the event that put him in the spotlight and set him on his glorious trajectory. David, the man who, no matter how much was against him, would say, I've set the Lord always, always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. And yet, when we say David and, the next thing, or maybe for some of us, the first thing that comes to mind is David and Bathsheba, an open public scandal of betrayal, lies, adultery, 
cover-up, murder, an event that changed, and not in a good way, the rest of David's life. As someone puts it in, in one story, David breaks almost all of the Ten Commandments. For all of history, David is known most for his greatest win and his most ignominious defeat, both of which are huge and hugely consequent, consequential. How could that happen? As I immerse myself in the David and Bathsheba story again, I, I still find it hard to get my head around. Or perhaps is what I find it hard to get my head around why it is that I find it too easy to get my head around. I don't want to watch the game film because it's too discouraging. I don't want to believe that the people God calls me to look up to might have a dark side. Why? Because I don't want to have to face up to the fact that that means I have a dark side. Oh, let's just look at the bright side. Let's just emphasize the positive, the good things. Sorry, folks. Life is not like that. As I was scanning my news feed this week, I happened on this quote from a well-known pop culture personality whose personal life is a well-publicized disaster, even more so than most. She, she had put out a picture on social media with, with, her, with herself and her teenage sons from whom she's been estranged most of their lives. And she said, look at these two great guys. I must have done some things right. Really? But that's what we so easily do, right? We, we want to convince ourselves that that we're, we've done some things right. Well, of course we've done some things right. But how is that really working for you? Trying to control our image by trying to make people see some good things does not work. How much of our, our angst, our, our emotional health, our feelings about ourselves are related to trying to hide from, to bury some of the dark side stuff that refuses to be buried. Trying to stuff it in and, and not look at it doing all kinds of things to distract ourselves, to stay ahead of it. So let's take the next step in getting ready for Easter, the event that we are to regularly, not just once a year, regularly use and look at to examine ourselves as we participate in, in the Lord's Supper or communion, to go back and watch the game film of, of, of not just of our actions, but of our thinking, our inner processes, and discover is there a sign of that things might be going wrong here? In your Bible or your Bible app or on the tab on the bottom right of your online church platform, turn to the second book of the book, uh, the second book of Samuel. In the first major section of the Bible, the, the old pre-Jesus part of the Bible, the tenth book, Second Samuel, that documents the main events of the reign of the glorious ideal king, David. God is Blessing, David. Things are going well. God's no's have become yeses. Chapter 8, verse 6, we read, The Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. And then verse 13, And David became famous. The Lord gave David victory wherever he went. And not only did God give David victory, by all outward measures, David is handling his victory well. Chapter 9, David shows kindness, chesed, the loyalty and faithfulness and loving kindness of God to the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, a disabled young man who David brings into the circle to honor him and care for him. He's given a place literally at the king's table. Amazing. Not only does he show kindness to the, to the marginalized inside his kingdom, chapter 10, in order to repay a kindness that the father of the current king of the Ammonites had shown David, he shows kindness to an enemy, the Ammonites. But it's not received well. They accuse David of trying to spy on them and overthrow them. And, and the Ammonites enlist another group of people, the Arameans, and say, hey, if you don't help us, we'll both get defeated, but together we'll deal with them. And, and so once again, David is at war. And once again, God gives David victory in a battle. Swiftly, definitively, David deals with the Arameans. But before they're able to finish it off with the Ammonites, 
winter sets in. And so they take a break until spring. And then we come to chapter 11, when it all comes tumbling down. We'll, we'll look at the two parts of this story over two weeks. Today we'll take apart, we'll break down the mechanics of David's fall. Next week, we'll look at how God restores David, because he does. God is not a God who wants to, to, us to stay in defeat. He wants, us, he wants to restore us, to free us. But it's a restoration that comes as David faces seriously and in detail what went wrong. First of all, in here. The anatomy of a fall. Not pretty, not uplifting really, but it's necessary. Chapter 11, beginning at verse 1. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army to finish the job. And they did. Hold it. He what? He sent. Remember that word. Was David not supposed to be the king at the head of battle? Is that not what they wanted a king for? Is that not what God has commanded David to do instead of building a temple? Remember? David, the temple's not your job. Leading people to security and rest in the land by leading their battles. That's your job. Hmm. But the verse goes on. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. Okay, it's all good. Maybe we were wrong. And then it says it again. But David remained in Jerusalem. So is that a good thing or a bad king? Is, is this leading us to think that David's done such a good leadership job, he's developed his men well enough that they can just turn it over to them and they can do it on their own? That David has learned the art of delegation? David's now over 50 years old. He's been on the throne for about 20 years. Is this maybe a sign that he has spent the winter restructuring his team to be able to take his leadership and Israel to another level? And, and, and maybe the star of Joab, David's longtime friend and trusted advisor and key military general, is rising, and, and maybe he will be the next king? Or is this a signal that David is slacking off just a bit? That David is giving up just a bit too much in the wrong kind of way. Is this delegation or is this perhaps abdication? And as we think about what kings typically did, let, let's think about how David became king. What it was that put David in the position for his big win over Goliath. Remember that? It was that Saul, the king, was not willing to lead the army into battle. Whoa. So what is going on? How is it that David so easily, so quickly, falls into the trap that we're going to see he falls into? It's very simple. David's fallen into a pattern that is so human, so basic. Just bury it. Isn't that what we do? If there's one thing this story screams out at us, it's this. Don't just bury it. From this story, we're going to see three things that we need to come to terms with about burying. Number one, burying thinking that David has done that sets up for this fall. Burying two. Number two, burying strategies that we use when we fall. And then finally, we'll just briefly look at burying solutions for when we fall. So, when we think through David's story, in light of that first time, or that first line, he didn't, or he remained at Jerusalem, we can, we can see, as we look back, some ways in which David must have developed some, some burying thinking patterns that led to this fall. Even using all of the good stuff that's happening to avoid looking at, to cover up some weaknesses, some dark side factors that are going to take him out. What is it that David is not facing? If, we, if, if I could get into a time machine, go back and meet David, and was given the opportunity to ask him one question, I know exactly what it would be. David, looking back, what was your real blind spot? What was it that you buried, kept yourself from seeing that you were in a dangerous situation? 
or, or did you just, did you see and just didn't care? What happened, David? Or maybe I'd rephrase it. D David, was there anyone in your circle that you had invited to speak into your life and warn you when they saw some of those dark side factors surfacing? I, I would probably try to sneak in a question of Joab, David's military general. Joab, did it not concern you in any way that David didn't come? Or, or was it maybe an ego thing for you? Did, did you feel David was, was not confrontable, that you'd lose your job? Or did you maybe have a dysfunctional concept of your own loyalty to him, that, that, that you couldn't tr challenge him, you'd go along with him? We can't do that, but I think this story points to a few things that we would surface, things that David just, just buried that should have been signals in his mind and his heart. Number one, let's go back to, to the thing about a king that God was concerned about. Deuteronomy chapter 17, in the law of God, as God's giving the law many years before a, before a king even happened, God told him, this is not the solution you really need. And he told them that they would come to the time of demanding a king. But through Moses, God wanted them to or warned them about what kings do. And so he gave them some criteria for the king that they had to choose. It had to be one of their own people. Why? Because he, he would know their story, the story of God. He wouldn't make it, uh, uh, mix it with other stories. The first thing the king was to do then was not just be one of their own people, but to, to write out for himself the law of God. Write it out, handwritten, and, and to read that law every day and follow that law every day. That was the one big thing they were to do. And then three things the kings were not to do. Boundaries the kings were to establish for themselves so they would not fall. Verse 16 of Deuteronomy 17, the king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them. For the Lord has told you, you are not to go back that way again. Number two, he must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not, three, number accu uh, accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. Don't accumulate horses, wives, and gold. Really? What's with that? Horses. What, what, why not accumulate horses? So he would remain dependent on God in military matters, not by might nor by power, but my, by, by my spirit, says the Lord, is what the prophet says. So that the Gideon stories, the, the Joshua stories, the David on his way up stories would be the norm. So everyone know, would know that there is a God over Israel. Don't accumulate wives. One of the most visible symbols of power and signs of pride of, or, or, and of the ability to control and to be able to spread your seed for future generation was how many wives a king had. Not to be. Don't accumulate gold. Why? So he would not think more highly of himself than he ought to think. So he would stay humble. So he couldn't just buy himself out of trouble. Money, sex, and power. The big three. So how did David, the man after God's own heart, how, how did David do with that? Pretty good, actually. When he defeated cities, we're told that, that he would kill all the horses. He didn't stockpile them. When he defeated cities, he took the gold and, and the valuables, and literally, he, he gave them to God. He stored them for the temple that he wanted to build and then gave it to his son to build. Wives? David did accumulate wives. 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 12. David is on the rise, establishing his kingdom. It says, and David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and had exalted his kingdom above Saul's for the sake of his people Israel. And in the very next verse, very matter-of-factly, it simply says, after he left Hebron, David took more concubines and wives. He already had some, obviously. He took more in Jerusalem 
and more sons and daughters were born to him. The author doesn't comment on it, doesn't evaluate it. It's, it's almost as if he's inviting us to think, wow, God is really blessing David. And for many people, it would have been, well, I guess that's what kings do. It's regrettable, but it's what you've got to do to maintain your power. And yet, as we look back, we realize that this man, after God's own heart, is really not facing all of his own heart. So, so how is David burying the dark side realities of his own heart? Well, number one, uh, a man who was very influential in, in my life, uh, Dr. Gene Getz, wrote, wrote a number of books on, on some of the Old Testament figures, in, including David. And one of the things that has always haunted me is one of the lessons that he points to that this experience suggests is that it is possible to be going two directions at the same time. You see, we like to, to point to the things that, that prove we're going this direction, the right direction, God's direction. It, it's quite possible. David might have said to himself, hey, two out of three, that's better than most kings. And, and, and if I do the, the big two, read God's word, give away the things that I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm fine. Hey, look at how God is blessing me. You see, we use the good things to hide the bad. Got any two out of three ain't bad tendencies? Well, I'm doing this and this, and look, God is blessing me. I must be doing something right, right? Hey, just look at the positive. Friends, we, we are to look at the positive. We are to be affirming, but success tends to allow us to fake it. I, I had a professor in graduate school who was concerned about pastors and Christian leaders, and he often said to us, don't believe your own press reports. And if he was alive today, I know what he would say is don't believe your own social media postings. And, and, and listen to the language when we talk about some of those dark side weaknesses. We, we have this funny way of talking about our dark side, don't we? Well, I, 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 I tend to care too much. Really? You can't care too much. Well, I just own it too much. You can't I don't own it too much. You can own it in the wrong kind of way, but you don't own it too much. Well, oh, here's, here's the worst one. I'm, I'm just too humble. We may not say it, but we believe it when our partner says it about us, right? What, we try to make ourselves look good even as we speak about our dark side to try to bury it in our minds. Or we say, well, that's just who I am. Deal with it. Two out of three ain't bad. So about what are you saying? Yeah, I can see what you're saying. That is who I am. That's who I fear I might be. I, I, I need to face it before it destroys me and everyone else around me. Are you, are you thinking of something? I think most of us have some things to think about, don't we? Number two, how do we bury our dark side? So it'll eventually get to us. Let's go back to David's experience with the king of Ammon in chapter 10. David, being humble, is, is kind to the king of Ammon. And David gets accused of having bad motives. I, I wonder if all winter long, as he is supposed to be resting, restoring himself, if David isn't allowing that to chew up his inner life a bit. And when it comes time to re-engage, it's like, forget it. My men can handle it. I won't even give them the honor of showing up. Sometimes the reason we disengage is because we have not been appreciated like we think we should be. We've been ignored, and we just say, forget it. It's not worth it. But as far as we know, David, David doesn't even face that factor. Number three, it, it could be that some of these, these other things are catching up to him, and David just simply puts simply gets out of rhythm. He's been out of activity, active engagement for a season. Resting has become relaxing. And he's just not ready to come back. I love how David Parks puts it, and he's reading David's story into his own life. And he says, when we fall out of rhythm, 
we tend to make more bad decisions. Okay, that gives us an opportunity to talk about COVID season, right? We're getting ready to regather. April 11 is what we're aiming for. And some of us, are, or maybe some of our friends we're concerned about, have just got out of the rhythm. I met, I met someone this week who found out I was a pastor, and she asked about how we were doing church during the season. And she said, you know, my church does online. And, and when it started, I was gung-ho, but, I, but I've just dropped off. And, and she just let it hang there. She didn't justify it. Didn't, didn't sound like she was defending it. But she was obviously thinking of something. And it made me wonder, is she wrestling with whether it's even worth it, necessary to go back? Life just has a new rhythm, and well, God still seems to be blessing me. Be careful. Number four, David has not yet fallen, but all it will take is time and opportunity. And that time and opportunity comes. He didn't go after it. It just showed up. Chapter 11, verse 2. We read, One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. And David, what? Sent someone to find out about her. David, as king, has, well, of course, a room with a view. And, wow, what a view. David has not yet sinned outwardly, but it's close. The man he sends is the first one to say anything in this story. We don't know if he's intentionally sending a warning Whatever it is in, in this man's mind, in David's mind, this should have been a big, big red flag. 3B, the end of, end of verse 3. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah, the Hittite. David, th this is not just an object for you to use. This is someone's daughter and not just anyone's daughter. This is the daughter of Eliam, one of David's core mighty men who has put himself in harm's way for David faithfully for many years. So David could have what he has and be where he is. A man who's out where David should be right now. This is his daughter, David. This is someone's daughter, and this is David, this is someone's wife. David, she's already taken David. And not just anyone's wife. This is the wife of Uriah. One of the leaders of David's troops. Uriah, a Hittite, which means that he is a convert from outside of Israel who has seen something different in Israel and the way they follow their God, who has, has embraced faith and is not just fighting for David, but he's fighting for the God of Israel. This is David's last chance, a huge warning, a barrier put in his face to keep him from falling. But David blows it off, and he buries the warnings that come to him. What do we say? You don't understand. You don't get it. It's amazing what we can bury with that line, right? It's amazing the warnings that we can blow off with that line. One more way we try to bury our dark side. There's a word that is used about David and his anonymous someone that will become the key word for the rest of the chapter. That should have been a signal to us in the very first verse that this is not going well. It points to the overall go-to go tendency that, that we set us up, that, that sets us up for fall. After we fall, or and after we fall, sorry, what, what does David do? He sends this man because he can. In the rest of the chapter, David is using authority to send people. Nine times this word is used. He sends this one. He sends that. It's all about David char taking charge. David 
trying to control the narrative. That is what we do, right? We try to control the narrative in our own minds with, with our own excuses, with others by not accepting warnings. And one of the number one things we can do to keep ourselves from falling is to listen. Listen. Find someone who will tell us the truth about ourselves, truth we may not want to see, truth that sometimes hurts. Somebody who does believe in us but still tells us the truth. So who have you listened to in this past year? Who have you listened to that told you some hard truth? Who has tried to tell you some hard truth, but you've blown it off like David did, does? It's one reason that we're told in the New Testament, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. It's not just for others' sake. It's for our own to see things that we're refusing to see about ourselves. What is your go-to burying line or your strategy to avoid facing the vulnerabilities of your dark side? One of the gifts God has given me is a wife who is not into burying. Years ago, there was an issue that, that came up between us, and, and for several weeks in a row, she decided to put it on the table on Saturday morning. I would get up really early Saturday morning and, and work at least until noon to, to put my final prep together for Sunday morning so I could spend the afternoon with the family. And, and whenever she got up, before our two preschool kids were up, I would come upstairs and, and have a cup of coffee with her. Three Saturdays in a row, we were having breakfast, sitting over coffee, and she put the issue on the table, which meant we had to talk. And three Saturdays in a row, I said, in frustration, now is not the time. Let's deal with it later. On the third Saturday, I said, Yes, we have to deal with it, but it'll take some time. You always bring it up on a Saturday morning just as I'm getting ready to go to studying. That does not help me. And she said, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to press your buttons. It's just that all week long I'm busy, and Saturday morning I'm relaxed, and it just comes into my mind. And then she said it. I get that Saturday's not a good time for you, but if we're not going to deal with it now, when will we do it? And so I looked at my calendar, and we created a time, hired a babysitter, and we worked it out. We worked it out so well, neither of us even remembers what the issue was. Don't bury it. So, so what, are, what are you burying? What's your burying thinking that is tending to take you out and that might lead to your fall? Something you're trying to cover up in your mind with positive thoughts about yourself, but it keeps coming to the surface? Something you're afraid people might think about you that you're accusing them of thinking about you? Something you're hiding with all kinds of good things, hoping people won't figure it out? Don't just bury it. Burying thinking that leads to a fall, and in this case, a major, major fall. Verse 4, or verse four of chapter 11. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home, and the woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, Oops, I'm pregnant. Okay, there's some stuff in there we could talk about, but basically it, 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 it not only happened, but David is busted. The law David had committed himself to knowing in his heart and, and that he's obviously found some way to blow off comes true again. Book of Numbers, you can be sure your sin will find you out. But David is still in charge. David has the power to be able to control the narrative. And so the burying behaviors start piling up as David tries to cover up his fall and it is all about control. Verse 6, so David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. You got to think Joab's wondering, why, why Uriah? Joab sent him to David, and when Uriah came to David, or David asked him how Joab was, how the, how the soldiers were, and, and how the war was going. David's a smooth operator, making it look like 
well, this is the first time I haven't been in the lead, just, just checking to make sure everything's okay, maybe making it look like, like, like his number one concern is for his men. My, we can make ourselves look like we really care, don't we? Can't we? Verse 8. Then David said to Uriah, go, go down to your house and, and wash your feet. It's all good, Uriah. Go home. Take a short break. Take a shower, some sex. And, and by the way, here's a gift basket. So Uriah left the palace and, and a gift from the king was sent after, uh, after him. Here, here's a gift basket, for a, a nice surprise supper, candles included. You're a good man, Uriah, but David has no idea how good Uriah really is. Verse 9, but Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master servants and did not go down to his house. David was told Uriah did not go home. So he asked, Uriah, haven't you just come from a military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark, and Israel and Judah are staying in tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I would never do such a thing. Uh, the ark and the people, after last week's episode about the ark in chapter 6, it makes you wonder what David thinks, as Uriah mentions, the ark, right? Wouldn't that have been just a, a little bit of a convicting stab to David's heart? David, David, come clean. David has one final round, a, a sure thing. Get him drunk. Verse 12, then David said to him, stay here one more day and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and he drank with him and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among the master's house, master's servants, he did not go home. Uriah, the foreigner, drunk, is more righteous than David is when he's sober. And so to protect his image and cover up his behavior, David pulls out all the stops. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab, sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out front where the fighting is fiercest and then withdraw from him so he'll be struck down and die. So Joab, so while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. David has forced Joab into cooperating with him in cover-up behavior. In order to make David's plan work, Joab can't just send Uriah in there. It has to be a group of men. It has to look strategic. And Joab knows that it's the stupidest strategy in the world. And he knows his men know it's the stupidest strategy in the world. David puts Joab in the place that, that he has to lie to cover up for him and for David. Joab knows that the, the guy he sends back might say, David, I don't know why he did it, but Joab just put his men needlessly in harm's way. And so Joab tries to control the narrative for David. Verse 18, David, Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you have finished giving this king the account of the battle, the king's anchor may flare up. He may ask you, why did you get close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerobesheth? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Didn't you learn from that? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you, then say to him, Moreover, your servant, Uriah the Hittite, is dead. I can just see this messenger saying, Don't shoot me, I'm just a messenger. I can see him wondering, What is David going to make me go back to tell Joab? Here I am in the middle. I did not sign up for this. But David's smooth guy that he is helps this guy understand the real world. Verse 25, David told the messenger, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. David puts his hand on the guy's shoulder and he says in his most encouraging voice, buddy, 
sometimes life just happens. You, you, you win some, you lose some. Sometimes it's, it, it's just, it is what it is, and, and you've got to leave it at that. Losses are lamentable, but you can't brood on them, brush them off, and move forward. You're not going to make it in life if you don't do that. Because David knows that he has it under control. It's all going to work out well. David just moves on. Verse 26, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. It's all good. Dodged a bullet this, on this one. Got to be more careful next time, right? But the chapter, this phase of the story, ends with one ominous line. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. David, be sure of it. Your sin will find you out. So let's just talk a bit about the, the go-to burying behaviors in our lives that we use. And, and sometimes they seem to have worked. To, to hide it when we have fallen, maybe even been confronted about it. Number one, we go on the tack, right? We shoot the messenger. Who do you think you are? Number two, we, we start criticizing others. We focus on all kinds of hypocritical behaviors and others we can point to, and there are many, to take the spotlight off ourselves. Number three, when it's pointed out to us, we, we withdraw, pick up our marbles and pull out. Number four, oh, we, we just... Give gifts like crazy so people will think good about us more and more. Number five, we, we seek experiences that will give us a high and, and bring us above the downer that's inside because of what we've done. And number six, we find all kinds of ways to keep controlling the narrative. Folks, it won't work forever. It will catch up. And even now, you are beginning to feel like life is piling up. You feel like you're under a big pile and it's crushing you. I know there are all kinds of things that crush us that have nothing to do with our sin, with our behavior, but more of it does than we want to own, right? Will you draw a line for yourself in your own heart this week as you think of getting ready for Easter? Very quickly. It's not in the story, but we can't talk about burying without talking about the burying solution of God for the ways that we try to bury the things that cause us to fall in his eyes. What is God's burying solution? Paul just puts it so clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter, 5, uh, chapter 15, verse 3. The gospel, the good news from God is that Christ died for our sins and was buried. God took all that stuff that we try to bury, put it all on Jesus, buried him under it so we could be freed from it as we confess it, bring it out in the open. And confessing it in a way to gain freedom from it involves, as James says in chapter 5, confess your sins to one another. Name them, own them, so you can be released from them and be free. So, so you can't, so you can have someone who you draw into your life to help you see ahead of time, before you fall next time, some of the ways that you might be burying the warning signs. Can I say it one more time, friends? Don't just bury it. It's not working. Maybe in ways that you can't see yet what it's doing to your marriage, your kids, affecting you at work, your reputation. It, it's, it's not working now, and ultimately it will take you out. What is it you need to bring into the light of God's truth with someone to discover the incredible grace and love of Jesus? Maybe you need to just press on the, on the prayer button right now and invite someone to pray with you. Maybe to get ready for Easter, you need to take on an assignment. 
on the screen right now is an inventory. You can, you can copy it down right now or, or download it from our website, erbc.ca slash inventory. Just some questions to work through every day when you go to bed. Number one, how and when has my dark side threatened to show or shown today? Number two, who might I have hurt today that I just need to talk to? And number three, as I replay the tape of the game today, were there any warnings that I that I that might have come my way that I blew off and didn't listen to? Number four, who do I need to listen to that will tell me the truth about myself with love but with clarity? And number five, what keeps coming to my mind that I don't want to write down? Will you do those things every day and see how God might want to help you? Let him bury all that stuff so you can be free. Lord Jesus, we, we confess before you in our hearts that there are some dark side tendencies that we probably haven't looked at clearly enough in light of your truth so that we can live in your love. Father, help us even as we get ready for Easter to be able to celebrate it fully and with joy because we have recognized our tendency to bury and we have brought it before Jesus and others in his name. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you for joining us, and I hope today's message on David has helped you better understand how God is preparing us to live in his story this upcoming week. We'd love for you to start following us on Facebook and Instagram, or subscribe to our YouTube channel below. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.